From about the age of 35, we begin to slowly lose muscle density, which can affect our quality of later life. So this video explains the cause and offers a solution. Hi everyone and welcome to Exercise for Health and today we will be discussing sarcopenia which is age-related loss of muscle mass as well as dynopenia which is age-associated loss of muscle strength both of which predispose older adults to an increased risk for functional limitations. I will also offer my advice for how you can slow down and maybe even reverse this process. Sarcopenia has always been considered a natural process we will all experience. When in our mid to late 30s, we begin to lose about 0.8% of our muscle mass each year. And over the decades, when we reach our 60s, 70s and 80s, this process accelerates to potentially losing around 40% of our muscle mass from what we had in our physical prime. This process can cause a number of problems in later life. There will be an increase of intramuscular fat tissue, meaning the muscle doesn't function as well. So simple tasks like picking up something from the floor become much more difficult. There will be an increase in insulin resistance, causing a greater risk for type 2 diabetes. There will be a reduction in the body's metabolism, meaning less energy is burned each day, making you more prone to body composition changes with a higher fat mass. There will be an increase in anabolic resistance, meaning the body doesn't synthesize proteins as well. There will be an increase in muscle inflammation, which increases pain and decreases functional ability. And eventually, there will be poor balance or diminished reaction time for muscle contractions, due to the loss of its strength and power. More recent studies, however, have shown that this decrease in muscle mass and strength is not solely reliant on your age. In today's modern and convenient society, we've become more sedentary as we get older, spending more time sat down in front of a screen. This increase in sedentary behavior can be more detrimental to our muscles than the age factor alone. A research study on healthy elderly people that had complete bed rest for seven days showed a decrease in lean muscle mass of over 3%, which is the equivalent of four years of typical muscle loss, but in one week. So being ill or having prolonged bouts in hospital without activating muscle tissue can rapidly lose skeletal muscle mass, strength and function, which is why one should try and keep the muscles activated when ill, even if that means doing some leg exercises in bed if you cannot stand. The greatest loss of muscle mass and strength over time will be experienced in the legs, which can ultimately lead to balance problems and falls. So reducing the time that you are sat down will help. If we all did the recommended 10,000 steps every day to keep ourselves moving, this will certainly help slow the decline of the muscle mass in the legs. This means walking five miles or about eight kilometers a day, or walking for a period of about one hour, 40 minutes. Now, if you lead a very sedentary lifestyle, doing 10,000 steps in one go and every day can be a bit daunting, and it may be a bit too much to start out. Therefore, starting with 2,000 steps a day that's more manageable, and then building it up over a number of weeks may be a better way of including it. Although just being regularly active every day and limiting your sedentary time will have a huge beneficial effect on your long-term health outcomes. Resistance training though will be the best option for reducing the decline of the muscle mass and strength and it's even possible to reverse it. I've had clients in their 70s that have actually increased their strength from a variety of resistance training sessions over a period of a few months and they felt as though their muscles were leaner compared to what they had before they started training. This will ultimately be the key to an improved quality of life in your later years. Strength training should be done on at least two days a week, but three days a week would be better if you're training all the muscle groups in the body on each day. But remember, the muscles need time to repair and recover from strenuous workouts. So leaving a day's rest between each training session will ensure optimum results. If you did split routines though, which is basically targeting only one or two muscle groups in one training session, then you could end up doing strength training more than three times a week. Resistance training that will improve strength and mass will naturally mean lifting a heavier weight to stimulate the muscle in the right way to get the response that you're aiming for. 
This will mean a lower repetition range of around six to 10 reps per set, rather than the 10 to 15 reps generally used for muscle conditioning and endurance. You should reach the point of failure where you cannot maintain a strict technique or the point of muscle fatigue within this six to 10 rep range. If you get to 10 reps with good form and you can keep going, then the weight you have selected is too light. This training type will also include a higher volume of the exercise to break down and induce a change in the muscle structure. This is doing more than just one set per exercise and may be doing as much as three to four sets per exercise with a 30 to 60 second rest between each set. It is better to choose compound exercises over isolated ones when resistance training for strength and muscle density. This means choosing exercises that move more than one joint in its action. Examples include deadlifts, squats, lunges, step ups, the bench press or press ups, lap pull downs or pull ups, seated rows or bent over rows, and the shoulder press or military press. Using heavy weights with a higher volume in this nature obviously carries its own risks. If you have other comorbidities, such as high blood pressure, a heart condition, fibromyalgia, or other joint or muscle problems, then this type of training might be more difficult to adopt. Anybody new to this type of training will probably have to start at lower intensity anyway to allow their body to adapt to it, but also take any exercise considerations for their existing health conditions into account. You may find that if you are strength training regularly, you will know intuitively whether or not your strength is improving because over the weeks you'll be able to lift more weight or for more repetitions during your sessions so this will indicate to you that some progress has been made. However there are a couple of standardized tests you can do to monitor your progress. The first is using a hand grip dynamometer to test your strength if you have access to one. Using this handheld device while standing and gripping as hard as you can for a five second period with your dominant hand, it will measure your maximum grip strength. It's normally measured in kilograms and you should perform the test three times and record the best of the three. Then perform this test again after 12 weeks of resistance training to see if you've improved. You can then use this table to see how well you've done for your age group. When I did this test, I scored 52 which would put me here on this table. However, it's more important to maintain or even increase your score over a 12 week period, regardless of where your score sits on the table. A second method for monitoring muscular strength and endurance, which is better suited for older adults, is the sit to stand test. This is counting how many times you can stand up from a chair in a 30 second period, where the seat is 17 inches or 43 centimeters from the ground. It's good practice to have the back of the chair against a wall so it doesn't move, and the performer should cross their arms over their chest so they don't use their arms during the test. A repetition is counted if they stand fully upright at the top of the movement and sit down completely in the chair at the bottom of the movement. After 30 seconds, the total number of sit to stands is then checked against a comparison table for their result, which you can see on screen here, and if you come out below average for your age group, then it does put you at an increased risk for falls. Finally, your diet will also play an important factor with maintaining muscle mass, particularly ensuring your body gets enough high quality protein so that it helps build the strength and mass in the muscle when you're not training. Now, this isn't my area of expertise, so although I have some basic knowledge, please don't ask me questions relating to nutrition in the comments but generally around one to one and a half grams of protein per kilogram of your body weight should be a rough estimate for your daily intake. This will vary depending on how active you are and could be even as much as two grams per kilogram of your body weight for serious muscle gains. Therefore, if you weighed 80 kilograms, you would consume around 80 to 120 grams of protein a day or as much as 160 grams a day for extremely active people. For reference, there is about 18 grams of protein in a tin of beans, around 24 grams of protein in four eggs, and about 26 grams of protein in a tin of tuna. But bear in mind that one gram of protein has four calories of energy. So the more you consume, the higher your calorific intake will be. And it would be normal to gain a bit of body weight if you're trying to increase your muscle mass, 
but you will also be leaner. I hope the information in this video is useful and can motivate you to ensure you do some form of strength training on a regular basis that you can keep up for life. If so, please give it a like by clicking the thumbs up button below and consider subscribing if you haven't already. But thank you so much for watching and remember to stay active and keep moving to feel better. Eee.